This presentation is brought to you by the SDG Decision Education Center. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, A Conversation on Ethics, with Stanford professor Ron Howard. My name is Hannah Winter, and I am the Program Director for the Wharton Executive Education and SDG Strategic Decision and Risk Management Certificate Program. Today's session is presented by the SDG Decision Education Center in collaboration with the Oresti Institute of Executive Education at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania, SDG's university partner in the Strategic Decision and Risk Management Certificate Program. The courses and certificate blend Wharton's academic and research expertise with the 35 years of real-world management consulting experience of Strategic Decisions Group. These concepts and skills empower participants to make high-quality decisions and embrace risk and uncertainty for competitive advantage. I'm delighted to be joined today by Professors Barbara Mellers and Ron Howard. Professor Mellers is the I. George Hyman University Professor in the Department of Psychology at the University of Pennsylvania. In January 2011, she was appointed as the 11th Penn Integrates Knowledge Professor. Professor Mellers is a globally influential scholar of decision making. Her research examines the factors that influence judgments and decisions, including emotions, self-interest, past mistakes, sensitivities to risk, and perceptions of fairness. She is an author of over 100 articles and book chapters, co-editor of two books, and a member of numerous editorial boards. Professor Mellers is also the academic director for the Wharton Executive Education and SDG Strategic Decision and Risk Management Certificate Program. Professor Howard is one of the two original founders of the field of decision analysis in the mid-1960s. He's one of SDG's founders and a leader in this discipline. Many accolades have gone to Ron over the years. In 1986, he received the Frank Ramsey Medal for Distinguished Contributions to the Field of Decision Analysis. In 1998, he received the first award for the teaching of operations research and management science from INFORM. And in 1999, he was elected to the National Academy of Engineering, which is among the highest professional distinctions awarded to an engineer. Ron is currently a professor of management science and engineering at Stanford University, where he directs teaching and research in the decision analysis program. He is also the director of the Decisions and Ethics Center, which examines the efficacy and ethics of social arrangements. He has written five books, including Ethics for the Real World, Creating a Personal Code to Guide Decisions in Work and in Life. Many of you submitted questions when you registered for the webinar, and I invite you to submit additional questions in the question panel. Hopefully, we'll have time to address some of these questions before we end our session today. And now, let me turn it over to Barb. Ethics is a very important topic these days. Uh, some people say we actually have a crisis of ethics on our hands. This is something that Ron has thought hard about. He takes an engineering approach whereby he guides people to create a personal ethical code, understand key ethical distinctions guided by the leaders in ethical thought, and learn to apply the ethical code in life situations. His goal is to teach people to make personally satisfying decisions in a wide range of ethically sensitive situations. Ron, you've been studying decision analysis since the 1960s, uh, and then you turned it over to ethics. What led you to do that? Thank you, Barbara. For the first 20 years of my professional life, I developed decision analysis, which allowed people and companies to make decisions in the face of uncertainty and complex preferences. When I was asked by a company to do a decision analysis of a major product and to make the results come out in a way favorable to that company compared to the products of its competitors, I had to refuse on ethical grounds. I realized that I was like a martial arts teacher who had taught students how to kill with bare hands, but had not given them the basis for when to use their knowledge. At that point, I developed a course in ethics called The Ethical Analyst, 
to make sure that my students were ethically sensitive in using what they learned. So let's do a poll. How often do you encounter ethically sensitive uh, situations in your life? Uh, very frequently, every day, often, a few times a week, sometimes, uh, just a few times a month, rarely, less than once a month, or never. Uh, I'd like you to enter just one choice and then click submit. So just wondering, how often do you encounter ethically sensitive situations uh, in your life? Here you can only select one. Later we will have a poll where you can select uh, more than one. All right, it looks like uh, many of you are responding. Um, let's go ahead and see the results. All right, so it looks like uh, Ron and Barb that uh, almost half of the audience uh, says it's sometimes a few times a month, but then it's kind of spread uh, amongst the others and no one responded with never. Uh, Ron, would you like to comment on that? Certainly. Uh, I recall a message I got from one of the students who'd studied decision analysis who said that although he had uh, done a lot of professional work and made a lot of, uh, done a lot of activities, that when he went and reviewed what the messages that he got every day, that the course that he relied most on was the course in ethics, because many of the, so many of the things that crossed his desk uh, involved a, uh, an ethical decision that he had to make. So I'm a, I'm a little surprised that that's, it's, uh, we don't see people who have uh, uh, never seen an ethical decision or even or rarely seen one. Uh, maybe that's a matter of ethical sensitivity. Well, Ron, what is the uh, first step that you would advise people to take toward making ethical decisions? Well, what we recommend and what students do is typically begin the class by recalling situations they have faced in life that were ethically sensitive. And these situations range from getting too much, uh, too, too much change in return for a purchase to being responsible for the death of someone. So a very wide range. And once they've heard, no, no one in, in any class has ever not been able to come up with a situation like that. Uh, and this motivates them to begin constructing their personal ethical code. Hmm, that's interesting. So what are the benefits of a personal ethical code? Well, to me, the main benefit is what I call avoidance of remorse. By remorse, I mean realizing at some point in the future that you've treated someone unethically or done something unethical without realizing it at the time. This is different from the regret you might feel for making an investment that produced a loss. To avoid regret, you must learn decision analysis so that you make only good decisions, though some of the outcomes may be bad. In your book, you make distinctions um, uh, along three dimensions, prudential, legal, and ethical. Could you tell us more about these distinctions? Sure, Rep. Prudential is pretty simple. That just means something you do in your personal interest. For some people, it's prudential to brush their teeth twice a day. For others, not at all. Legal means that your society will use force against you or your property if you either do or do not do particular actions. Ethical means consistent with your personal code of ethics. An example arose when church members near the southern U.S. border sheltered refugees in Central America who had entered the country illegally. Sheltering them was ethical to the church members, illegal and prudential only if they could justify the risk of punishment given their other obligations. Another aspect that in addition to the three dimensions that we talked about here, is the distinction between positive and negative injunctions or positive and negative ethics. Many of ethical codes are, are 
formed in terms of what we call negative injunctions. Uh, I will not lie, I will not steal, I, I will not harm people. And those are fine. And, and the nice thing about a negative injunction is, uh, for example, I, uh, I didn't steal anything all day yesterday and, it, and I've had no problem in, uh, in doing that. But if I had positive injunctions, like making sure that people who are misinformed go know the truth, or returning property to its rightful owners or uh, preventing harm. Well, just returning stolen bicycles to the, uh, that, uh, are, uh, uh, that are taken by things on the Stanford campus would be a full-time job. So anytime you have a positive injunction, you have to put in, to be realistic, the limitations that you will not really be able to do as much of that as you think you will in most situations. However, negative injunctions, with just not doing things that are ethically uh, a problem for you, that's really easy. Hmm. Well, um, you talk about three areas of ethical concern, lying and deception, stealing and harming. And I understand that in your course, you often administer an exception survey in which you ask course participants to indicate when it's okay to lie, steal, or harm. Um, let's let's show some of these um, possi possible exceptions and do a quick poll. All right, so here's just a subset of the exception survey for lying and deceiving. The actual survey has 21 different options. Here we're just gonna list five of them. So lying and deceiving are wrong except for, and then consider each of these, telling lies to save someone's feelings, telling lies in negotiation, telling lies to children, telling lies to prevent harm to others, or not correcting misimpressions. So here, uh, we'd like you to choose all those that you think apply and then click submit. A note here that compared to that previous poll, you can select as many of these or as few of these as you would like before clicking submit. So when is lying and deceiving wrong in your view, not in someone else's view, in yours? We're interested in how you perceive this. So it looks like uh, many of the poll responses are um, coming in. Uh, when is lying and deceiving wrong? So let's go ahead and close the poll and uh, take a look at the results. So it looks like uh, here, um, uh, many people think it's okay to tell lies to prevent harm to others, uh, as well as to save someone's feelings. Um, and then there's a small small group that say it's okay to tell lies in negotiation. And then of course, this, this ever uh, present debate of when you should tell lies to children um, ha had some votes as well. Uh, Ron, would you like to, to comment a little bit about, uh, about the results as well as how you use this survey and the types of discussions you have in your courses? Well, it, it's interesting that of the three areas <clears throat> of uh, lying and stealing and harming, of course, uh, the, the people that I'm dealing with, you know, Stanford students and then other uh, professionals, uh, are really not so interested in stealing or in uh, harming people. But the question of lying is a major concern for them, particularly when uh, for students, for example, they think white lies are very important. You know, starting with, do I look fat in this dress kinds of issues, all the way to, uh, you know, I'm, uh, can I, uh, how would you like to go out tonight? Well, I'm washing my hair, which is not true, but it's a way of avoiding getting into why you really don't want to tell the person why you don't want to go out with them. And one of the things we've found is that, that when you use those social convenience kinds of lying, you're, you're really not deepening the relationship with the person that you're lying to. And if you do that, we have examples of this in the book and, and in the class, of course, about how you can, by telling the, the real truth, which you have to work at sometimes to figure out what the real truth is, you deepen the relationship with the person you're interacting with uh, rather than uh, shutting it down. Um, thank you, Ron. Many people are interested in how to become more skillful in ethical decision-making. 
in business and life. What do you recommend to our listeners to begin this journey? Well, it's really just a matter of making ethics one of the primary goals in your life. Uh, in other words, when, when people uh, are on their deathbed, they seldom say, well, I should have you know, sold one more contract or, or uh, done, uh, uh, you know, uh, tried one more case. It's more about the relationships in life and whether they feel good about how they have spent their life. And if you have had major ethical trans trans transgressions in your life, it's gonna be hard to come to terms with that. And in fact, once you become sensitive to the, the, this issue, uh, then or the set of issues, uh, then you simply and very easily choose the right ethical path without even thinking about it. But if you haven't thought about it, then you're subject to that remorse that we talked about earlier, which can be, be very troubling uh, if it occurs to you. Do you want to say something about how leaders could can foster a culture of ethical decision making in their organizations? Well, if only we could put that in a bottle and just give it to them. <laughs> but mainly, <laughs> mainly leaders uh, lead by example. Uh, and which means if you're finding a, a situation where you've got ethical discrepancies, you will finally usually find one of the sources of that in how the organization is being led. So if you want to have an ethical organization, be ethical yourself and also follow some good ethical rules for the organization that they can state, for example, in their organization, no one will be required to take any action that they find ethically ex ex objectionable. Uh, that means that everybody can have will be encouraged to follow their own ethical codes that, that presumably are consistent with those of the organization uh, and that to the benefit of customers and every other uh, person that the organization comes into contact with. Well, that's really interesting. Um, thank you very much. Now, let me turn the session back to Hannah. All right. Thank you, Barb and Ron. Uh, here are some questions that I would like to pose to our um, speakers now. Um, uh, we've had quite a few on the on the lying topic, uh, Ron. So I'm wondering if you wouldn't mind uh, answering answering some of those. Um, so, uh, according to you, Ron, um, which lies are acceptable to tell? Well, you're talking about my personal ethical code now, right? And yeah. I, <clears throat> in the class, we talk about the two main kinds of ethical theories that uh, exist. Uh, one is uh, based on uh, the actions you take, it's the Kantian code, uh, and the other is based on the consequences of those actions, which is utilitarian by name. They have bigger technical names, but we don't have to get into that. So I find it best to be a Kantian. As a matter of fact, if you think about drawing decision trees or decisions, uh, then if you're a Kantian, all you have to do is eliminate any alternative that violates your ethical code. So, so if you just don't lie, so I will never lie, then anything that involves lying. Uh, more specifically, more practically, if you were, if you were a person for whom uh, uh, abortion was unethical, uh, then when you were considering medical treatment for something for which a, abortion might be one of the possible treatments, you wouldn't have to consider that. You would just block that out and then look at the remaining treatments. So it's very easy to be to be a, uh, an action-based ethicist once you know uh, what things you will not do. Uh, if you are a utilitarian, then you have to do a more complicated uh, decision analysis, balancing the chances of different things happening. Uh, and uh, that's another very popular kind of code. It's kind of the greatest good for the greatest number. Uh, although you can, you can see the problem there. I mean, suppose uh, killing you and getting your liver would save a thousand other people from dying. Well, well, for a consequentialist, that might be a pretty good choice. So uh, basically, I'm an action-based ethics person. I'm going to tell the truth. My real, real problem isn't lying, but figuring out what the real truth is in any situation. And I'm not going to deprive people of their property, stealing or defrauding. 
uh, and I'm not going to harm them to harm innocent people, though I reserve the right of defending of myself and others. Uh, so it's, I have a pretty simple ethical code. My problem is just to uh, uh, to be sure that I apply consistently whenever I face any situation that's ethically sensitive. So very simple if you want to be action-based, much more complicated, and you better be a decision analyst if you want to be a utilitarian. All right, so we have so many questions that's uh, hard for me to, to, to choose just a few, but uh, I want to build on this idea of the uh, personal ethical code. So we've had a couple questions that are related to that. Um, so uh, one is, um, uh, if, if two people have an ethical code that conflict, how do we decide which one is better? And then uh, related to that is if there are two people who work together, for example, who have an important discrepancy in their ethical codes, how do you get them to work together to make a decision? Well, it's a real challenge. I mean, I, I would have real difficulty working with someone who thought uh, they should lie anytime they thought it would benefit them. As a matter of fact, I don't even want to associate with such people uh, in my personal life. So so differences in ethical codes can be the difference between a you know, horror in what the other person's doing and what you think is particularly acceptable. You know, I don't want to make this sound simple, but one of the things we do in our, our Stanford class is go back to the Nazi era and look at how uh, all the things that led up to the Holocaust, which killed you know six million Jews and six million other Slavs, Gypsies, and so forth, and say how did this happen in one of the most advanced countries in the world at the time, where you could take a dirigible flight from Hamburg to New Jersey, get there faster than any other way, uh, and that studying the, the, that part of uh, history shows uh, not only that people who normally wouldn't do terrible things did terrible things, but an amazing part of it is that, that whenever you see an ethical violation of one kind, you see violations of other kinds. I mean, look at the Holocaust. Not only were innocent people killed, the harming part, but they were stolen from, They're looking at the piles of gold and other things that were taken from the victims, and finally they were lied to. They were told they were going to take a shower when they were going to be gassed and killed. And that was practiced before World War II uh, on, on German citizens who were mentally disabled with their families being told that, that they had just died in the hospital when they had in fact been, been uh, died, with, died with the poison gas and, and being told that they were taking a shower. So I think this business of your ethical code is a pretty serious one. And, you know, we're talking about ethics and business here and lying and being clear in what you're doing. But, uh, you know, your life may be more determined by your ethical code than by anything, any other part of it. All right. Great. Uh, one uh, question, one other question I wanted to ask you uh, before uh, I ask you my last question is, um, uh, what about the ethics of bystanding? Um, the importance of bystanders being recognized because actors may be impaired, while bystanders may be more sober in a good position to intervene. For example, well, that, that's part by some students and so forth. Right. That that's very very good question, and that's why we need the three distinctions of prudential and uh, ethical and legal, because some actions that uh, uh, you may, in other words, you you may have this positive. Uh, uh, ethic that you're going to save other people, and that's fine, but, but prudentially running into burning, burning buildings may end up in just ki killing yourself as well. So you have to do a balancing of, you know, what do you really mean when you have these positive injunctions about balancing risk to you with risk to others and doing something that you would really like to do to help them? Uh, you know, you wouldn't, if you don't know how to swim, you wouldn't jump into the river to save a drowning person because you're more likely just to, that both of you will drown. But if you're a good swimmer, that might be an excellent thing to do in some situations. All right. And last question, Ron. Is there a Ron Howard approved code of ethics for economists and decision professionals? And if so, what is it? I think each of us has enough trouble being getting our own ethical code right that uh, <clears throat> there's no such one that I would prescribe for anybody else. I can only prescribe for myself. And as a matter of fact, this whole study of ethics, while uh, you know, is a, is really a study of your own ethics. We could spend uh, you know 
We could spend forever commenting on what other people have done that's bad and judging it and so forth, uh, even when we just read about it in the paper. What a total waste of time. Let's make sure what we do is ethical, uh, and then perhaps that will spread to the people in our lives and to other people. All right, that's great. Thank you so much, Ron, and thank you, Barb. This concludes today's session. Thank you for participating.